Um, and one that some of you have been reading about and you've picked up on, and I wish I knew where because I'd like to straighten you out text line by line, is participant observer. <laughs> Holy cow, we had more participant observers and participant observations in our papers this time than I could believe. Now, what is participant observer? It is a $64 word to say observer. It shows high sophistication and great training. It also shows that you're lost. <laughs> participant observer is a very precise term. And it cannot be used except in that precise way. But I want you to go into the gym and move it tonight. And I want you, you do know where the gym is. Do you ever go in there? Once in a while. <laughs> they're, they're not used to seeing you. Yeah. All right, I want you to go in and just kind of slide into the corner somewhere, maybe bleachers or someplace, end of a bench or something. And for 45 minutes, I want you to pay attention to signs of and ways that people demonstrate leadership within your perspective and seeing that set of behaviors going on in the gym. You'll see many different kinds of things. Try to make a list. Note different behaviors whereby people seize, grasp, or otherwise are afforded leadership. You think you can do that? Think you could. Now, have I assigned him to do an observation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have I made it reasonably clear? you imagine that it'll be worthwhile to do? Okay. It doesn't depend on his being a participant observer. In fact, you'd have to call that assignment what? He's an observer. He <laughs> doesn't need a qualifier. He's an observer. Now then, Bob, you've already said that you don't spend much time in gym. So I don't believe that I can think of any way that you could be a participant observer in the gym tonight. So I've got to think of an environment to put you to work in tonight where you could be a participant observer. Can you give me a suggestion? It is a workout room up there. If I got on a bike and started riding on that bike and all the people are there, I could participate in the exercising while other people are there. Is he on the right track? That's the distinction. In other words, he is deliberately taking part in a parallel activity so that being an observer itself is not evident. So being a participant observer is one way to subordinate or to literally hide your primary motive, that is being an observer. Now, if I send him into that gym tonight, I'm not getting killed if I ask him to go out on the basketball court at his right age <laughs> and be a participant observer by going in there and volunteering to get on the, the basketball squad that's out there doing its thing tonight. I mean, people that get over 22, like you, um, can get killed out there with them kids, right? Amen. You right. tell them, right? No, the participant observer is a person who is participating in the environment, but is using that as a cover to be unobtrusive as an observer. Now, some of you may have meant that in your particular statements, and I didn't get harsh with you about it, but I can't believe that you did without your mentioning what was the participating role. So I can't believe many of the things that I was reading. Now, I grant that you find that in the books, but the books are presuming that you understand that the participant observer and the observer are two different kinds of posture from which you watch what's going on. That makes sense. So don't willy-nilly throw in participant observer. But on the other hand, when you're designing, you think about the possibility. This is again back to 923. What are the kinds of things you could do? Like you've almost got to go to your observer and say, you know, where could you fit in as a legitimate participant and observe something relevant to what we're interested in within that environment. That was a good example. Well played out. Yeah. All right, I think that's the rule, that's the list. Yeah, that I, these things occurred enough times that I was fretting about it. Now some things that occurred surprisingly often that I was very pleased about. 
Do you mind if I tell you a few things I was pleased about? Uh, two minutes? Okay. I've only got two minutes for this. Other people will do it in 30 seconds. This is the good list. The good <laughs> <laughs> I was absolutely thrilled with your care in avoiding third person. There was only one paper that was infected with it, and I sprayed a little DDT on it, and we got most of them fairly promptly. There were two or three others that kind of slipped over from time to time. But it was really satisfying to see the way you picked up on my warning not to use first person. And it gave you an exercise in doing a style of writing that was more careful and more precise than many of you are inclined to do, I suspect, typically. So thank you very much. I was also impressed, and the grades show this, I was also impressed with the number of people who really brought in all kinds of features here, there, and yonder from what we've done in class, and some of you from the textbook. And it was delightful to see the degree of integration that showed up in your papers. I thought the papers were marvelous example of how much you can do if you just discipline yourself to some simple guidelines. And uh, once again, I remind you of the, of the story of the walking on water quite often is dependent on knowing where the stones are. And if now you know where the stones are, you know how to walk on water. And many of these papers kind of look like you've done the miracle of walking on water because you, you really did an awful good job. I was very pleased. I shouldn't imagine that if you just continue to deliver this level of, of, of careful behavior, I can't imagine we're going to have any real trouble in here. It's going to go, I think, pretty smoothly. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you helped somebody else with the paper that you did and they did. You, you did some helping back and forth. Let me see your hand. I hope that number goes up. I hope that number goes up because I think there are some things you can help each other with. We've done that in workshopping in the classroom, and that's why some of you are wondering why aren't you talking about that. But some of you are also working outside the class, and that's a good thing too because there's an awful lot that we can help each other see and feel more, more fully. So now we're going to go on with, with the experiment. We're going to take a break come back and work like crazy on the experiment stuff. <laughs> so put this one away. Now, don't say, I've got to find a program so that I can do it. How many times do I have to say that? You want to find a variable, a factor that can be manipulated. Yes, I know you can teach a person a program or not, but what kind of a variable manipulation is that? In the first place, not everybody's going to do the same thing with it. I mean, that's just asking for trouble. Now, I can include or exclude. That's something I can control. Within an educational program, or within a training, or within an activity. Or I can increase or decrease a variable within it. But I can have a theory by which I do that. See, what worries the life out of me is that you're still asking questions as if it's going to work to create a program, a training experience, as the treatment variable. No! How many times do I have to say it? No! That's too global. It's got to be more focused than that. Now, within a treatment variable, or within a, a program or an educational experience, I can experimentally increase or decrease a component. I'll give you an example. Many educational programs operate without any field experience at all. One of the variables that I can control is to add a field experience as part of this program. Now that's still programmatic, but at least it illustrates what I'm driving at. I'm going to provide a field experience for an experimental group, and I'm going to deny that field experience to a control group. See, when you talk about program, I get worried. It's going to give the program to some and not to others. Come on, that's, you know, if, if hit by a fuzzball, people look blue. <laughs> you know, oh, man, what do you mean look blue? Well, they just kind of look blue. Uh, you can't measure that. And what do you mean get hit by a fuzzball? Get specific.
get down to the level of what is the theoretical relationship. How many of you have any idea that there is a theoretical relationship between experience and non-experience as a kind of learning? Is there any difference between how you learn, how a person learns, by reading a book and going out and doing something? Is there any difference? Would you believe there's a whole body of theory about that? And there is a difference. Get your variables down to some kind of practical application of a theoretical point. You're going to decrease or increase or add or withdraw. That's the experiment. Now, experiments are like this. Experiments are inherently, inherently, statements like this. If I sit in a chair facing that direction, my back will be more visible. Hypothesis affirmed or disconfirmed. All right, what was my hypothesis? If I sit in a chair facing that direction, my back will be more visible. Now, how many times did you have to see me? How many times did you have to see me to make that judgment? No. Twice. Twice. Here's once. Here's twice. Now what in the world are we doing here? We're testing the hypothesis. I have to test it by giving you the experimental condition and the control condition. What is the experimental condition in that particular hypothesis? What is the experimental condition? What's the independent variable? Sitting in such a way that I'm facing that way. All right, now am I experimental or controlled situation? Right now, am I experimental or controlled situation? I'm sitting facing that way. That was the experimental variable. Therefore, I am in experimental mode. Now what am I in, for heaven's sake? How do you know it's control? You're not facing it. Yeah, because I'm not happen. doing the experimental version. Experiment has to be yay or nay. Don't try to make a descriptive study of it. Does that make sense? If I stand on my left leg, I will lose my balance in 20 seconds or less. And nobody bothered to look at a watch. How can you test that hypothesis without looking at a watch? Come on, wake up. If I stand on my left leg, I will lose my balance in less than 20 seconds. Hypothesis confirmed or disconfirmed? It's not 20 seconds yet. <laughs> it's not 20 seconds yet, and I lost my balance. So, hypothesis confirmed or disconfirmed? Okay, now there's, those are the two kinds of experiments. One that puts up a criteria. That's what this last one was. And says, given this condition, the criterion will or won't be met. Now, what was the experimental condition there? Standing on the left leg. What was the dependent variable? The balance of the balance. Losing or not losing the balance. There's got to be a pro and a con. There's got to be a sense of it will or it won't. There's got to be a sense of yes or no. That's inherent in the idea of an experiment. Is it possible for me to test the hypothesis 
If I sit facing this direction, my back will be more visible. Now, what am I sitting in? I'm sitting in. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I'm sitting in the experimental condition. Now, why can't I test the hypothesis by simply sitting in the experimental condition? Because the hypothesis makes no sense because it lacks what? Anything to compare it with. So that's why I need the other chair, and I need an optional or an alternative way to sit. That's inherent in the idea of experimenting. Okay? <coughs> when you're doing an experiment, you've got to think in terms of an experiment in which something is going to happen that can be measured for whether or not it is different, and it is different in a certain way. That's what the hypothesis is all about. Now, I've got to get you on the brief time that's left to culminate the logic of a hypothesis that is a pure experiment, and those that are a non-pure experiment are sometimes called a quasi-experiment. So I've got to move on here. But so, sometimes you really scare me to death when you act like you've never seen an experiment before. Um, let's go back to this. It's a simple experiment. All right? So this is what you see when you see experiment. If I do this, this will happen. But I've got to have a baseline, so I've got to have a contrast and I ideally would also have something closer to a pure experiment. And this now is going to become a pure experiment because I'm going to randomly assign literally identical or matched subjects to this pattern. Now, someone read this one for me. Just read the whole thing. Start at the left and go to the right. Read it, please. You randomized um, the subject. The, the subjects are random, random, randomly selected. Assigned. Uh, randomly assigned uh, to the control group and the experimental group. This is control. This experiment, which is which? The control is uh, the bottom. How do you know that? Because there's no experimental treatment. Good. All right. The lack of experimental treatment means this is control. Mm -hmm. All right. So their only purpose in this study is to provide a control that then tells us whether or not this thing makes a difference in terms of those two scores. Because if I see the same difference here, I have to believe that this was not significant. All right? So then read it across for me. Randomly assigning people to oh, an experimental um, group and a control group, group. And then... Uh, and then withholding the... First of all... And then observing, uh, giving or the pretest. measuring or testing or pretesting, good, both. To both groups. Right. Then... And then uh, introducing the ex experimental treatment to the experimental group. Then... Then uh, do the observations again after the experimental treatment to both groups. And exactly. compare it. Right, all right. So then what are we going to compare with what? I'm going to give these arbitrarily right now little letters so that we can all talk about the same thing. What are you going to compare now? Data from A, B, C, D. Tell me what you're going to compare. You compare um, A and C, and then you compare A and B, and then you compare, no, you compare A and B, you compare C and D, but then you need to compare A and C too, and then compare B and C. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Lily, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I'm just not quite convinced that you're clear on it, but I, you're not wrong. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, just take any comparison and tell me why you do it. <coughs> any of the several comparisons. Because you need to compare A and B All right. in order to know if the experimental treatment did, uh, does make some effect on the You're going experimental too far. group. You're going too far. I can't answer that question with A mm -hmm. and B. Can somebody help her? What else do I have to have at the same time? I can't answer that question with A and B. C and D. I've got to have C and D. Mm -hmm. In fact, the best way to do it is, first of all, I really need to analyze what first? What A comparison first? A and, C. A, and C. A and C. And what is that going to tell me? Are you both starting at the same place? Is there, is there any I really am after the same score there. What will it tell me if I have a big difference? That the groups really weren't random in their assignment, or they weren't out of a homogeneous population. So if I have a 16 here and a 722 here, I'm not dealing with the same set of people, right? But let's assume now that we've looked at these two and we see enough similarity to say that it looks like our control group and the experimental group are very similar. All right, let's assume that now. We've checked that out. What do we check out next? Now watch close, because there's a right and a wrong answer to this, and it isn't the logical, easy grab answer. What do I check out next? There are only two options. Come on. B, 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 D. D. B, D. To make the same kind of observation. Do. That's the hard one. You're not wrong. Any more than Lily was wrong the first time around. It's here, believe it or not. C, D. That's the next and the easy one to do. And you do these literally in terms of what you need to tick off. Why do I want to tick off C and D? I want to compare score C and score D. Why? Is there any uh, if I see substantial difference, what must I assume? <coughs> there, is, there is something getting into that thing beyond the design whether it's maturation, or whether it's history, or whether it's a lot of other rival hypotheses, there's something getting into that design that's going to reduce my confidence in the whole experiment. And that's one reason why I say you look at that one next. Because there's no use in jumping up here and saying, oh, good, we've got a big improvement here. We've got a big change here. Until I have some idea of the veracity, the strength, the integrity of this situation itself. And quite literally, if I see a whole lot of difference here, it may mean that I really don't go on, even looking at the rest of the data, because it, it's a blown experiment. But if I find comparability here, what do I do next? I've compared AC, and I've found comparability, similar. CD, similarity, then what do I check? AB. That's a much more vital way than comparing B and D. Because you see, if I compare B and D prematurely, I have no idea whether or not I have any reason to believe that there should be comparability here. Because I don't know this one. So number one, number two, then I'm ready for number three, which is here. Now let's say I've done it this way. My AC came out 21 and 29. Now let's go ahead and make it 30. Then I looked at this one, and it came out 24. Now what do I know so far? <coughs> check this one, I check that one. I got 21, 30, 30, and 24. Uh, I'm, I'm making this more like real life. It's not a storybook case. This is the way it would come out in real life. Numbers seem to hop all over the place. Scores, instrumentation. Unless you're counting people's legs. I mean, I don't know many things stay as stable as can be played. But uh, that's not what we're doing here. We're measuring something else that's more tricky. What do I know at this point? I've compared and I've compared. So there's a great variation in the baseline without treating There is appreciable or great amount of variation. Uh, I know that if I make some assumptions. 
if I assume, for example, that the maximum scale variability is 0 to 5,000, do I have great variability here? In other words, I would really have to know what the scale variability is. So it doesn't follow simply because these numbers are bigger than one another that automatically we say, you know, there's great variability. There is variability, but we knew that anyway. That's one reason I'm showing you the real world. There's always variability. And let's assume here that I really don't know how big the variability is yet. But there's something else that I know, in addition to the fact there is variability. I know something that's very, very, literally reassuring in this experiment. What is it? The control groups of 24 and 30 seem to be bigger than this one. We know that, but that's not the exciting part. That's within the scope of, see the variability here is 6, the variability here is 9, the variability here is only 3. So we got variabilities running from 3 to 9. In other words, B doesn't have to go up a whole heck of a lot for you to be very impressed by it. Why is that? Because in your control group, the score is going down. Yeah, if there's any testing effect, see, that's one of the things that I, that I know, is the testing effect is not driving the score up. You follow me? I know that. That's one of the other things I was saying, you know, what do I know here? I know the testing effect is not driving the score up. It may be, in fact, driving it down, which doesn't make sense. So there's something else driving it down, and what do, I, what do I have as a reasonable assumption about what may account for that down score? See, it's probably not the ordinary stuff you think about. It's probably not developmental, it's probably not historic, because it's driving down. It's probably what's called normal variability. That's very reassuring. This score went down, not up. That tells me there's a lot of normal variability here. See, I've got three cells of scores here that are made quite literally on the same population. I have three different times that this measurement is made because these people, if we truly have randomized, these people are comparable to these people at that point, and I got a the biggest variability right here. And if I've really done a good job of assigning them, I have to look at that, because this raises the question. It's telling me that the variability on this thing is very great, or likely is great. Of course, if I use the 5,000 N out here, it's uh, 5,000 Y out here, it wouldn't necessarily be, but. Could, could you be looking at it as the same, is regression toward the mean the same thing? You're kind of coming toward What is same? regression toward the mean? That's a real possibility. The more times you give a test, the more your outliers on the low side, the extremes on the outside, start to come to other. That's a spooky one to believe, but if you don't believe it, you can't do stat. Uh, there is such a thing as regression effect, which means that exactly as you put it, put it very well. Um, there is a tendency to go toward the mean of a given instrumentation over time. If, if a person makes a, a 620, the next score, 410. The next score, 360. What is the after? What is after be the next score? Is it after be as great as 620? It's after to be less than 620. That's the best way to understand it. Is that this is probably normal variability at the high end? Just happen to pick it up because the scores subsequent tend to be in for the mean. So the odds are that the next score won't be greater than this one. That's regression in fact, all right? Uh, I don't particularly think you can illustrate that one way or the other out of this, but the point here is that this is an encouragement that whatever is the spurious variable, if it is a spurious variable, is not pushing in the direction you would expect it to push. Because a, a testing effect will generally push this score up, not down, all right? And history or maturation will generally push it up unless it's a depressing historical phenomenon. For example, a whole class's mothers died. Uh, that's going to produce this. 
That's a historical fact. But that's not too likely. All right. Now what we're going to do then is compare this one next. And when we get this score, we find that this one is 43. Now what do I know? Now what do I know? We know that the treatment is having an effect. Probably. Enter the word probably. We've got some other work to do on it before we can be high confidence, but the treatment is probably having an effect. As best we see this model, this variability is, is down 6. This variability is up 22. Now, is that different? That's pretty substantially different. And this will pick up the control group, what would have happened without the treatment. And in the treatment, you're seeing this change. So we understand that. Does that make sense? Right. Now, why is the pure experiment usually <coughs> difficult to impossible? There are several answers to this, but play with it a minute. Why is the pure experiment usually difficult to impossible to implement? in an ordinary social situation, whether admissions or education or hospital maintenance or whatever. Why is it difficult to impossible to, to operate? Can't control all the variables. Uh, Normally, you are the That's not the crux of it. It's, it's hard to. It's always hard to control variables, but that's not the crux of it. A and C is never. I didn't quite process this. Pardon me. Let's just catch this thing literally then the bottom of the or who? Yeah. Normally, you are dealing with people. So? It's really hard to control it. I mean, people are changing. What is the normal. word that he really wants instead of control there? He's using a technical word in the place of another technical word. He's using the wrong technical word. He's using a logical layman's word. And he's using it in a layman's way. And it's a right statement from a layman point of view, but not from a scientific point of view. He doesn't mean control. Say your statement again. It's hard to manipulate. <coughs> it's hard to manipulate. See, when you say it's hard to control, that speaks to the question of control group and control in the design. You speak about manipulating, you're talking about the difficulty of quite literally pushing people around, assigning people to situations. You'll be in this group, not this group. You'd be surprised. That's extremely important. I have a question yep. at that point. For example, if you are dealing real world with your church, yep. and you say to the church where a pastor, you say, well, we want to start a new program here. Mm -hmm. and, but before, we, we want to do some kind of experiment to see if this program will be good. To not guess things, mm -hmm. just start and stop in some months. So this program will be, for example, home groups mm -hmm. to help uh, improve your personal life. So it, it will be hard to assign people in these conditions to this manipulation. So Even they are members of the church and they they know what's going on and they, they want that program and even this situation will be hard. Do you think so? Well, I think you're, you're saying it probably is not as hard because you're dealing with a bunch of people who are all pushing in the same direction for a good experience in yeah. church and in their religious yeah. mm -hmm. development experience, right? Yeah. That's not a safe assumption. No, mm -hmm. safe. <coughs> no, it's not a safe assumption unless Brazilians are fundamentally <laughs> different from other human beings. I know about other human beings in other parts of the world, and I've only worked in Brazil for about seven years, so I really don't know much about Brazil. Uh, no, it isn't a safe assumption. Can, you, can anybody tell me why it's not a safe assumption? We, we're talking about individuals forming a group. We don't know specifically what the individuals are thinking. You can have a church full of people that are largely of goodwill, largely enthusiastic about what's going on, largely trusting their leadership to say, we need you to do this, we need you to do that. Largely, people who are willing 
to go along with a logical plan. Did you hear the problem? What is the problem? I can't say what I just said without using the word large. And what do I mean by that? There are others. <laughs> That's what I mean. There are others for whom that characteristic does not pertain. Nobody's ever seen a church where everybody is that lined up. Do you remember the evidences in the New Testament church? One of the very first things they ran into was the apostles had said to them, we're really in need. We're in a collective need. We got a situation where we're going to have to pool our resources. And everybody said, oh, sure. And they were largely enthusiastic about pooling their resources and dividing out as people had need. Remember that one? Now, largely, that group didn't include Ananias and Sapphira. And it only took two to end up with the first sacred slaughter we have in the New Testament. Well, not first, but first, but truly sacred. God put them out of their misery and suggested that the disciples should wind them up. And they wound them up all right and took them out. So, in other words, we should have some warning right there that even under that enthusiastic moment, it's largely this, but not quite. That's my biggest problem. And the more sensitive the design, the more careful the sampling and all that, the more hazard. All right, now that's one of the very important reasons why it's extremely difficult, because how in the world do you do this among human beings who are in a position to say, I know that's what I was supposed to do. I'm supposed to be in the Tuesday night group, but I just couldn't make it in the Tuesday night group, but I'm going to be in the Wednesday night group. But it's turned out that your Tuesday night was the experimental group, and the Wednesday night was the control group, and what you were planning to do with these people was carefully, carefully designed for that carefully designed. You got it? And especially since when people begin to vote with their feet, and show up on the wrong night. They tend to move toward people that they see as more like themselves. That's called the homogeneous unit principle. People tend to flock toward people like themselves. So what does that mean you're going to get? You're going to get people that have chicken feet on Tuesday night and duck feet on Wednesday night. Where you'd like to have, ideally, you know, half chicken feet, half duck feet in this and half chicken feet, half duck feet, and that. No, people that have duck feet like to go with other people who have duck feet. And you just want them not to look below the chin. And they're looking around saying, you know, this isn't my group. I have duck feet. That's what happens in the real world. Okay, what else is wrong with the experimental design as you come to the real world of doing an experiment with people? Manipulability, assignability of people is extremely difficult, number one. All right, what's the, what, what are some of the other major issues? Different experiences of the people involved. Human beings differ much more widely than control or than experimental animals. Experimental animals for whom these designs are primarily modeled are much more similar. And you can buy experimental animals, as I've said before, from the producers of laboratory animals that are genetically identical. We just don't have that lack of variability in human experiment. Now, if you have a lot of variability, what does that say about needed group size in your experiment? And control group. If you have a lot of variability, what does that say about the size of your groups? What size groups do you need? Very large. They need to be much larger. As variability goes up, subject load goes up. So quite often you find yourself in a situation where you don't even have enough subjects if you use everybody. And that's because of the greatness of human variability. If you start matching 
you know, as you look around this room, we're, we're dealing here with a, a relatively small group, but just think of the incredibility, the unthinkability of trying to match in this group four people in this group. I mean, <laughs> we got a lot of variability running in here, and yet you people are all highly selected, narrow representation of human society. Is variability in a local church greater than you got in this room or less than you got in this room? Greater. It's greater. It's greater. You better believe it's greater. A lot greater. In the first place, we have survivors here. Survivors of high school, survivors of college, survivors of master's degree programs, and now, well, let's talk to some survivors. We may have survivors on the board. And that's the essence. If people can survive that, it must be a very narrow set. No, I mean, be honest. It's a, it's a very narrow set here. And what do you have in the local church? It's a very wide set. How do you match? How do you set up experimental control group? You just can't use it. It's literally impossible. And I get such a kick out of people who struggle away and say, well, this time we're going to try, you know. This time we should be able to do it. This time we're going to take a lot of factors into account. And I say, bull loony. No way. I have long since given up ever being able to use pure experiment in small group studies for purposes of missions and religious education. Forget it. So unless you're doing a well-funded, very large-scale study, it's just not going to work. Now, what does that mean? The models are bad? No, the models are great. The assumptions in the models are not matchable in the real world. You just can't match the assumptions. Now, i got good news for you, after all that bad news. This is where Campbell and Stanley come in. From about 1920 till about 1970, the majority of experimental work was done by what category of social science? Sociologists. Someone's a sociologist, that's wrong. Educators, that's wrong. It's uh, psychologists. 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 And what were psychologists noted for? They still are, as a matter of fact. They were noted for a behaviorism that was largely quantitative. And they had all the models that they needed to do good quantitative research in the experimental model. And they were the primary advocates of the pure research model. Now, what did they do? They did all kinds of work on basically similar human beings. They knew the problem. So most subjects, now get this, most subjects for the great majority of psychological research were college and university sophomores enrolled in psychology classes. Most of the findings about human beings were done on what human beings? North American, usually white, psychology students in the second year. Most of them enrolled in a particular course called experimental psychology. <laughs> because in the course, experimental psychology at virtually any university since about 1935 to now, when you sign up for that course, you look at the college catalog. You are expected, indeed, yea, barely, required to be an experimental subject for anywhere from 50 to 100 hours as part of your enrollment in that course. That's the way the experimental psych profs get, got, always have gotten their subjects. Sometimes they pay them, sometimes they don't pay them, but if you have to do 50 hours in order to get the credit in the course, you'll probably show up. And if you're in that course, you will participate in the experiments. Those experiments are still going on. Do you detect a problem if you're generalizing about human beings out of that narrow set of human beings. Do you detect a problem? And Campbell and Stanley have a name for it. They would call it lack of, and it's a kind of validity. External. External validity. Lack of external validity. Campbell and Stanley's work on reliability and validity 
literally the, the sources of rival hypotheses, has given a whole powerful understanding and vocabulary that causes us now to look with a great deal of suspicion on that whole line of tradition of experimental psychology. One of the reasons we teach this course separate from the psychological emphasis is exactly at that point. Because psychological research is still deeply infected by that bias. It tends to be generalizations, not on human beings, but on college sophomores in psych classes who are largely white and enrolled in experimental science. Now then, what's the answer? Campbell and Stanley came up with the answer. Once they understood rival hypotheses, they said, now why in the world doesn't the old-fashioned notion of the OXO work? Now, what can you tell me? They ask this hypothetically. Why doesn't OXO work? Let's start back there. That's easy to do. We can, we can, uh, we can measure, then we can treat, then we can measure again. And by the way, this measurement is the same as this measurement. You do it the same way with the same instrument. And what you're looking for is any evidence of difference in the score because you'd like to think that this might have some effect. What's wrong with that? Now, you've already talked about it 30 times. Ago. Tell me quickly, what's wrong with that? There are too many rival hypotheses. So Campbell and Stanley, using their new technology, said, let us systematically rule these out one at a time. And we will rule them out by using techniques other than the control group. Because that's the key problem in doing human factors research. We can put wads of people in a group and treat them all at the same time. And we can take that same wad of people and measure them. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's selected wad or random wad. It's just a wad. What kind of people do we have in here? It's a selected and yet unselected wad of people. We've got black ones and white ones and yellow ones and, you know, you get them all in here. And brown ones and we got, we got all kinds of stuff. Doesn't look like a highly selected group. And yet it is a highly selected group. You're all survivors, as we said before. So it's, it's kind of a wide, all right? Big cluster. But would you believe that it's the same cluster that was here when we started? And whatever has happened here, it's happened in some way or another to all of us. Now, if we knew the norms, for example, of Wait, we'd be able to say, aha, during these several days of this class, the whole average for this class of weight has gone up two pounds. Two pounds, <laughs> 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 not eating and sleeping.